Hello everyone, welcome back to Preppy and let's do another series of VARC wherein we'll do one RC and few VA questions as practice. So with few days left for your CAC, let's get started. So let's begin with the RC now. So economic pacifism is based on classical liberal thought and is the purest representation of economic liberalism. So first sentence says that economic pacifism, it stems from what? Liberal thought, classical liberal thought. What it is? Classical liberal thought means it should promote free market, limited government should, uh, government should have very little power. Uh, so it says that it is the purest form of economic liberalism and it opposes war basically, which we'll see in the further lines. Its principal views, uh, its principal view is that the cost of weapons are too high for militarism to serve as a rational mean of, uh, of uh, national welfare. So the main idea is that the financial burden of maintaining military forces is way too expensive for a war to be a reasonable way to improve your na national economy. Right. So a military victorious uh, nation cannot increase its wealth by territorial expansion or weakening another uh, country's commerce. So you cannot increase your wealth uh, by doing uh, by either expanding your territory or weakening some others con other country's commerce. In the former case, former case is what territorial expansion. Those residing in the newly gained territory now trade in competition with the citizens of the occupying nation as members of a single custom area, taking advantage of country specific know how. What does it mean? When a nation takes over another territory, a new territory, the people in that region become part of the economy as a whole, right? And now they compete with the original citizens who actually know the country's specific know-how. So those who are actually residing in that territory, uh, they have more they have more knowledge about what works there. So now you're competing with, with those citizens. In the latter case, that is if you're weakening another uh, country's commerce, the destruction of an opponent's property reduced their ability to produce and consume. So if you're destroying their assets, that means you're limiting their capacity to make and buy goods, which will harm both the economies, right? Now, therefore, the victorious nation may well lose an important customer. So if you're by weakening the defeated nation, what you're doing, you, you can actually lose a trading partner or a buyer of your own country's goods and you're damaging your own economy. So, war reparations cited as a gain uh, to the victorious may actually benefit the paying nation. So, reparations are nothing but payments that are made by the losing side, which are often considered as a benefit for the winner, would actually help the nation paying them. How, let's see. Reparation payments represent a massive inflow of money into the winning nation, resulting in domestic demand increasing faster than production. So when reparations flood in the winner's economy, they boost the demand for goods beyond what the winner can produce domestically. This in turn results in upward pressure on the prices of goods in the victorious nation, creating a trade advantage for the paying nation. Now what happens? Suddenly, what inflow ho gaya tumhare paiso ka? So domestic demand but they now whenever demand increases and you cannot produce uh faster if demand is faster than production what happens it builds an upward pressure on prices the prices will go up now this is creating your trade advantage for the paying nation who can actually produce uh uh this one so uh the defeated nation can benefit from the cheaper exports War can also lead to lack of monetary discipline as governments to reduce the burdens of taxation or debt seek to pay for the expenses by creating more money. Monetization with the same effect on domestic prices. So what it means is government and war might print more money instead of raising taxes or borrowing responsibly. And this will in fact cause your uh, higher prices, that is inflation within your nation. If Enough nations embark on such an undisciplined course, a total breakdown of international finance and investment could occur. A problem that would confront all nations, even those that would emerge victorious, even your victorious countries will also suffer. If everyone starts to embark on such course, then international finance and investment breakdown is bound to occur and it will affect everyone. A final concern of economic pacifists is the net economic loss resulting from massive causalities on both the sides. Obviously, war in the two sides of the war, there are causalities to hope. Uh, improvements in military technology led to the development of weapons that resulted in mass slaughter of armed forces. Right. 
so that means uh, improvements in military technology led to the development of weapons that resulted in mass slaughter of armed forces. So military technology badali ki now you are doing mass slaughters of your armed uh, forces. Those mobilized for war are diverted from domestic production for the duration of their service, while those who die in war are diverted from domestic production permanently. Right? Uh, what, uh, what it tries to say is that people who go to fight in wars, they stop contributing to the economy while they serve, and those who die are lost as, uh, as workers forever. Right? Uh, war is not only concerned for economic pacifists, the burdens of defensive military expenditures are an additional point to focus. That means the cost of maintaining the defense system is also another issue that needs to be highlighted. Arm build uh, arm buildups result in increased debt and subsequently higher taxes and interest rates. That means spending heavily on these weapons that will lead to your higher national debt and which will in turn raise your taxes and borrowing cost. The net effect of such expenditure is the crowding out of private capital investment and social expenditure that then promotes the social condi uh, conditions that simulate the rise of socialism and anarchy. So the, these military expenses, they reduce money available for private business investment and social programs. Now it is potentially causing unrest and leading uh, to the rise of socialism or anarchy. Another consideration is that military power does not generate the benefits of economic power. So having military strength does not bring the same positive economic results as having economic power. Weapons expenditure generates less benefit to society than capex and put a country at a disadvantage in trade with less taxed non-militarized nations. So spending on weapons is less useful to society than investing in uh, capital expenditure. What is capital expenditure for infrastructure, highway, railways, all of these. And now it will weaken a country's competitive position compared to nations that do not have such high military expenses. If war and military expenditure are not beneficial to nations' wealth, what explains their existence? So, if they benefit not wealth, mein, to wo kyun hai? The short-run increase in expenditure is due to special interests that derive benefits from public expenditures on weaponry or acquisition of new territory. That means in the short term, certain groups, that means arm manufacturers or there, they will benefit from government spending on weapons or territorial expansion, which explains the persistence of the militarism. The legitimate function of protecting a citizen's interest overseas is altered to become an interventionism and aggression. That means what starts as a valid role for defending citizens is often turning into aggressive military interventions and expansionism. That means instead of protecting, defending your own citizen, your citizens, you are just in an open war, getting aggressive, trying to do military interventions, and we are trying to go, uh, expand your boundaries. Over time, however, improved distributional justice and increased democratization will result in an informed electorate countering the influence of special economic interests. So what the author says is over time, as society will become more democratic, better informed citizens will challenge the power of special interests that benefit from the war. Okay. Those concerned with the uh, cost will outnumber those the, who will derive the benefits of war. So eventually the majority of people who bear the cost of war will outnumber those who will benefit from it. Due to the growth uh, and an increased understanding of mutual economic interest, war will cease to serve as a foreign policy goal. So as nations develop and they realize the benefits of mutual economic cooperation, war will no longer be used and be to achieve your national uh, goal or national wealth. So it won't be a foreign policy tool. That is the main idea. So basically, uh, they, uh, they are just trying to showcase what are the uh, demerits of war when it comes to uh, raising your uh, national wealth. Okay. Now, I hope the passage is clear to you. I know the words have been not very uh, used to, but let's see. Let's see the questions now. The proponents. Proponents are the supporters of economic pacifism promote each of the following except free and fair trade, socialist ideas, 
physical or discipline. So, so now it does not promote socialist idea. It promotes free and fair trade. True. It also uh, talks about the physical uh, physical discipline. That is also true, but it does not support socialist ideas, right? Anyone has, uh, if there if there are anyone who doesn't know what socialist ideas are, that means uh, very left wing, very progressive, very radical, very revolutionary. Such ideas they are not promoting, right? Now. The proponents of economic pacifism believe that even if a nation won a war, it is still not advantageous for each of the following except the resulting burden on public expenditure will undermine special economic interest. Uh, the proponents of economic pacifism uh, believe that even if a nation won a war, it is still not advantageous for each of the following reasons except that the resulting burden on public expenditure will undermine special economic interest. Now, okay, we'll hold on to this. Any monetary gain from the war will disrupt the domestic market negatively. Bola to demand badegi, price badegi, to ye given hai. The conflict disorganizes trade in a way that it becomes unfair to some. Obviously, pura trade disorganized ho jata hai. Any wealth, if at all accumulated as a consequence of a war, will eventually be eroded. Because you have a whole disruption, aajayega. so this, is, this also can be inferred. Now, resulting burden on public expenditure. They have, there is no mention that public expenditure is going capex ho hai. That is not given. And hence, this is your answer. One is your answer. Now, which of the following is false? Opposes the arguments of economic pacifism except. So, which of the following is false? opposes the ekno, arguments of economic pacifism except war is a tool that policy war is a tool that policy uses to achieve its objective and as such has a measure of rational utility Uska idea nahi diya hai. military forces help establish alliances with weaker countries to protect them from military conflict no the more the electorate is informed the more they believe the advantages of military expenditure uh, this is also again if it is false is it up uh, is it opposing the argument of uh, this one no uh, there are special interest lobbies that campaign for more military spending to improve national security now this is opposing the arguments of economic pacifism they are saying that uh, the special interest lobbies are spending more are trying to spend more on military which is not the main idea of your passage this is your very clearly the idea of passage. Now, these are not given. These are some distortion of facts. Which of the following sentences best describes what passage is about? To show the benefits of the loser in a war? No, it's not showing the benefits of loser in the war. To portray the robust economic benefit uh, which peace provides. It's not saying that peace provides your robust economic benefit. Distortion of facts. To chart the problems of war on the economy, we can hold on to this. To overcome the prejudices that the prospect of peace from the minds of military leaders, nowhere mentioned. And hence, this is your answer. Let's do this. Question number five. Nothing so needs reforming as other people's habit. Fanatics will never learn that, though it be written in letters of gold across the sky. It is a prohibition that makes anything precious, Mark Twain, direct, eloquent, authoritative, damning. The framing is clear. Temperance activists are a bad guy. Fanatics hell-bent on changing other people's habits who are dumb enough to never learn the most obvious lessons starting them right in the face. The problem is that Twain never really said that. Instead, it is a mosaic of unconnected quotes uh, spanning different works of fiction and non-fiction over the years. So it's just saying that nothing so needs reforming as people's habit. Fanatics will never learn that because even if it is written in golden words in the sky, fanatics will never learn that. So, uh, so Mark Twain says that it is a prohibition that makes anything precious. Now, see the framing is that changing other people's habits who are dumb enough to never learn. That is the most problematic thing. That is the most difficult thing. And now the uh, now they are 
quoting Mark Twain, but Mark Twain never really said anything on this. Instead, there were unconnected quotes that that were spanning from different works of his fiction and non-fiction, and they got connected. Even though some quotes of Mark Twain seem uh, acritical about the prohibition, he may not have intended to say so since it is merely a composition of disconnected quotes that he said in different contexts. Exactly what is the point that Mark Twain never supported uh, this one that it is prohibition that makes anything precious. No, they are saying that the problem is he never said that. It is just unconnected quotes. So this is something that will hold on. The elegance and authoritativeness. Nothing is talked about the elegance of this Mark Twain. Uh, there are some of the some who use the quotes of Mark Twain to argue that people's habit should not be changed. However, they are wrong since the quotes were never um, quotes were wrongly. See, they they do not argue that it should not be changed. It cannot be changed more this kind. None of the quotes made by Mark Twain around the need to reform others justify using those quotes to change people's habits since those quotes were meant for fiction and non-fiction works. He never wrote it actually. These were, those were unconnected quotes uh, that got connected. Right. Now, next one. Gender fair language aims at reducing gender stereotyping and discrimination. Neutraliz uh, neutralization is achieved, for example, by replacing male masculine forms policeman with gender unmarked forms police officer, whereas Feminization relies on the use of feminine forms uh, to make female reference visible. That is, the applicant he or she instead of applicant he. Past research has revealed that GFL, that is gender fair language, has the potential to make significant contributions to the reduction of gender stereotyping and discrimination. When employed consistently over a long period of time, and especially when supported by well-informed controversies and discussions, GFL will contribute even more to the reduction of gender stereotyping and uh, discrimination and may thus function as another biometer for, uh, barometer for change. Now, GFL reduces gender stereotyping and discrimination by employing a strategy by employing the strategy of uh, neutralization or, femi uh, or uh, feminization in which the former replaces the male masculine uh, form with gender neutral forms and the latter makes female reference visible. This is nowhere given that it is a strategy of neutralization or feminization and feminization make females reference. No, this is not the main idea that it is a strategy of applying neutralization and uh, Neutralization ka ye matlab hota hai ki tum replace kar to. This is not explicitly given. Past research indicates that one way of eliminating gender stereotyping and discrimination. Now, we don't know if it is a past research or anything. So, how did we decipher this? So, again, not your solution. GFL, which uses neutralization or feminization of certain gender specific words, may positively reduce gender stereotyping and discrimination and may even have stronger impact if done over a longer period with well informed decisions. The main idea is your capture. And this is the answer. Now, identify the odd one out. Since it has been said, are the sinners who go on trying. The effort necessary to remain uncorrupted in an environment where fear is an integral part of everyday existence is not immediately apparent to those fortunate enough to live in states governed by the rule of law. So free men are oppressed who go on trying and those in process make themselves fit to bear the responsibilities and uphold the disciplines which will maintain a free society. Among the basic freedoms to which men aspire, that their lives might be full and uncramped. Freedom from fear stands out uh, as both means to an end. A people who build a nation in which strong democratic institutions are firmly established as a guarantee against a state induced power must first learn to liberate their own minds from apathy and fear. So this, see, they are talking about uh, how... Free, uh, you know, freedom from fear is one of the uh, stands out as both means to an end. Here also they are talking about apathy and fear. And here also they are talking about how free men are oppressed to go on trying. Same are also the ones who are trying, free men who are trying. And this is something uh, uh, not relevant to the context because here they are talking about, see, the effort that is, if you can see, there is a clear connection. 
people who build a nation in which strong democratic institutions are firmly established as a guarantee against the state induced power must learn to liberate their minds from apathy and fear you need to liberate your mind from apathy you need to liberate your mind from fear among the basic freedoms to which men aspire is freedom from fear so the nation also should do be in that one so free men are oppressed who uh, are the oppressed who go on trying and those in process make themselves fit to bear the responsibilities and uphold the disciplines saints are the sinners who go on trying the effort necessary to remain uncorrupted in an environment where fear is an integral part of everyday existence is not immediately apparent for those fortunate enough to live in the states that is governed by the rule of law now here no they are talking about a completely different sense that there are some states that are governed by the rule of law and it is uh, and it is not apparent to those who live in this they are fortunate enough this is completely out of context and hence we neglect this question a uh, although charles one invoked chance in various ways uh, in the origin of species he seemed not to have included a concept of drift in this account. Barwin noted in passing that variations neither useful nor injurious would be affected by the natural selection. The first serious treatment of drift are usually traced to two of the founders of population genetics, Sewell Wright and R. E. Fisher, although neither claimed to have developed the ideas behind drift. Uh, Red uh, credits John. So it is they are part of a sentence. It is unclear who uses the first, uh, who used the term drift first. So it appears again. Now, again, he never included the concept of drift. natural selection. So this is your order now. So that's it for today. Uh, we'll be back with yet another session very soon. Thank you. If you have any kind of doubts, please do let me know in the comment box.